Viewer discretion is advised. Chapter 2 Premonition Although America had been sheltered from the majority of the virus over the past several years, recently, it had joined the rest of the world as large populations began to become infected. As deaths rose and tensions grew among social and political platforms, the country found itself in a downward spiral as desperation took hold. To quell such hardship, some found peace in spending time away from the cityscapes and joined nature for a much-needed reprieve. A good example of this, a young family from Grand Rapids, the Meeks. With about an hour left of sunlight, it appeared to be a nice family road trip. Two teenage siblings, sit in the back of their family jeep. A mom and dad sit up front while holding hands. It was dad's turn to drive. The San Ysidro Mountains were beautiful in the summer. This was the time of year the Meeks family spent some well-deserved downtime at their lake house on Lake Barrett. They knew this drive well, so the family was delving into some fun road trip games to quiet the growing anxiety they were all feeling. It was the learned anxiety of the blissful getaway that lay before them. As the San Diego International Airport was long in their rearview mirrors, about 30 minutes or so, they figured they had about another 45 minutes to go. Although they were visitors here in Southern California, they were no strangers to the hordes of people and constant jarring noises of traffic that surrounded them 
as far as the eye could see. The big difference for them was the weather and that smell of salty seawater that seemed to envelop every oil-stained corner of the city. Of course, they were used to large bodies of water, as the Meeks were from Grand Rapids, about 25 miles east of Lake Michigan. But there was something so much more captivating about the saltwater air as opposed to the freshwater air they were used to. Perhaps the salty air just spelled out all the freedom and lack of obligations it typically came with. Trevor enjoyed family trips to his grandfather's lake house. He would often reminisce about the nights he would spend with his sister on the dock after a full day of family fun before their night would come to a close. As the two grew older and more self-sufficient, they would sometimes even fall asleep on the dock as the sun would settle behind the mountains. He remembered how him and his sister had discovered a sense of immortality on that dock. They would sit at its edge and admire a smooth rock they had personally picked from a recent hike through the nearby woods. Do you want to throw it? Beck would ask her little brother. Trevor would look up and nod with a smile, taking the small rock from her hands and chucking it as far as he could. They would soon hear a small plunk as the smooth stone would make its entrance through the lake's glassy surface. Beck was always the melodramatic one and would often memorialize the experience with her poetic words. But Trevor never minded that. He actually enjoyed the idea of him and his sister having something so real, yet so secret, as he would listen to her thoughts. They'll always be here, Trevor, somewhere out there at the bottom. We did that together. In the midst of a playfully fun game, a laugh in her voice and a smile on her face, their mom slightly turned her head towards the back of the car, glancing at the 16-year-old girl sitting in the seat behind her dad. Okay, Beck, your turn. Beck stared out the window and bit her lip as if to be looking for something outside. Okay, the letter D. As she said this, she turned her gaze to her younger brother and raised her eyebrows suggesting her inevitable, soon to be win. A young 14-year-old Trevor rolled his eyes. Words began flooding out of the other three family members, each one racing to be the winner. Drain, door, deck, duck, drapes. Beck smirked on in glee and just kept remarking, no, nope, not even close. Trevor chimed in, dork. Their mom let out a big laugh. Okay, first of all, that's not actually a word, at least not a real one. Slang doesn't count. Secondly, it has to be something you can see from your seat. Trevor quickly came up with his best legal defense. But Dad's right there. This time, it was Dad letting out the bellowing laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Very cute. Trevor continued. Well, Beck always cheats anyway. She's like a pro at this. She always comes up with words none of us even know existed. The car once again became loud with laughter. Suddenly at once, all of their phones began to ring. Amber, alert? Beck asked, as everyone began to scan over their phones. That is, of course, everyone but the driver. Then with a serious tone, the mom looked over at the driver's seat. Honey, I think we might have a problem. Carr was silent for a moment, as the three reading their texts tried to make sense of what they were seeing. Emergency alert. Ballistic missile threat. Inbound to San Diego. This is not a drill. What? The dad said with a fading smile. Noticing the shock on all of their faces, he quickly dismissed his smile altogether. What? Is it? He said again, as his eyes slowly drifted down to the phone his wife was showing him. Honey! His wife's frantic voice directed him back to the traffic in front of them. He swerved and barely missed hitting the stopped car in front of him, only to be met with another car involved in an accident completely upside down. Avoiding the next hurdle, he lost control of the vehicle and began careening off the side of the freeway. None of them could see the chaos in front of them 
as they slowed their vehicle and tried to make it through the weedy patches of grass that separated the 94 from the city roads. A bird's eye view would depict a freeway engulfed in accidents, running pedestrians, and vehicles making illegal exits. Apparently, the Meeks were not the only ones to receive the ominous alerts on their phones. He kept pursuing the city streets ahead of them, navigating the rough patches of ground, never designed for moving traffic. Watch out, the mom exclaimed as she pointed to a man running across the field, evidently one of the poor souls new to the growing membership of travelers, having recently forfeited their modes of transportation. I got it, I got it. He responded with a cool head as he slowed and made room for the man on foot. Just then, a car came screeching by them, obviously not observing their surroundings, but just trying to make their own way to safety. The faster moving car hit the man running across the field, sending him flying into the air and landing directly onto the family's windshield. The collision sent the four of them into high-pitched panic like screams. As the man hit the windshield, it shattered and blood went everywhere. Through the blur caused by bodily fluids and spiderwebbed like cracks in the windshield, it was impossible to discern one body part to the next. One thing was sure though, what once was a face was now a hollowed skull mixed with teeth and bone and had partially impaled their car's window. As the vehicle made a slight right turn and a final climb to the city road, the carcass gently rolled off the car and onto the grass to the most shallow grave site the four had ever seen. Shelter, we need shelter, there, over there. Their dad was depicting his every thought to the three of them, trying to be as transparent as possible to let them know he had things under control. They pulled into the parking lot of an elementary school, packed with poorly parked vehicles, scattered across the asphalt and grassy lawns. Trev, you hold my hand. Beck, you hold your mother's. Buddy system. Okay, guys. This has nothing to do with your abilities. We stay together, okay? They all scrambled from the car, grabbed nothing, paired into their designated teams, and ran for the closest doors. It was becoming dark at this point. Dark enough to have a hard time seeing exactly where they were going, but not dark enough to have yet activated the outside lights of the school. The first set of doors they came to was clearly some sort of gym or auditorium. Beck and her mom reached the doors first. They were locked. Trevor and his dad took that as a cue to immediately scan the school complex. There, exclaimed Trevor. He pointed to what appeared to be the administration offices. There was a large orange door with a slim rectangular window on it. The door was to a large cinder block building with several large windows to either side of it. The window to the right had been broken into. Being after hours and during summer, the school was obviously closed, but apparently previously arriving shelter seekers had made their ways in. The family raced inside and were met with an embracing community of a dozen or so people made up of men, women, and children. We couldn't get into the gym, announced a woman in the room to the newly arriving family of four. Beck and Trevor's dad looked at the group, then at the woman. No, no, no. This building is made of cinder block. We should be fine. Suddenly, a frantic voice began pleading in a language that was not understood by the Meeks. A petite, older Spanish woman with thick glasses, a cane at her side was sitting on a seat meant for a four-year-old and was trying to communicate to them. Trevor and Beck's dad scanned the group. Anyone know Spanish? A man in the group responded quickly. I know a little. I think her grandson is out there somewhere. She's been trying to tell us since she came in here. I think they became separated. Just then, the power went out in the building. The entire city was engulfed in darkness, as twilight was rapidly turning to night, sirens blaring from outside. Mrs. Meeks was staring out the window. Her husband, in a panic, began yelling in her direction. Babe, get away from there. 
You don't want to be just then, she interrupted him. Oh my god, I think I'm looking right at him. A small boy, about seven years old or so, was frantically trying the doors of the gym, right where the Meeks had been just seconds earlier, then disappeared around a corner. Without hesitating, she let her motherly instincts completely take her over as she bolted out the door, her husband failing to hold her back. Trevor and Beck listened to their dad's next instructions like deer in headlights. Beck, Trevor, stay away from the windows. He pushed them back beyond everyone else, lifted a hinged counter, allowing them access to a more secure area of the room. Stay down on the ground, under these desks, cover your heads, and stay together. With that, he quickly chased after his wife. A few folks were looking through the window, in disbelief, as they watched the couple leave the safety of the cement building. More people of the group joined the kids in hiding under desks. Trevor had all the red flags going up in his head as he disobeyed his dad and crawled out from under the desk and peeked around the counter's corner. There, he could see the silhouette of three figures peering out the window. He was hoping to see his mom and dad come back through the door. He certainly was not anticipating to witness the following string of events. A bright light lit up the entire room, temporarily blinding everyone. The building shook as the sound of glass was coming from the windows beyond the counters. Within seconds, the body of a woman was hurtled across the room and slammed down in front of him. Suddenly, he was yanked back under the desk by his feet. His sister and another young boy about his age acted fast and pulled him from harm's way. Once under the desk, he looked back at the body and for one quick second, before the lingering flash of bright light dimmed, he saw a woman laying on her back, coughing up blood. She had a large piece of glass that went straight through her left eye, deep into her head. He gathered up his knees and put his head between his legs as he began to shake. Suddenly, a voice beckoned the group from down the hallway. Everyone, over here, I found some stairs. I think it goes to the basement. Beck grabbed Trevor by his hand, and the two got to their feet and ran with the others. They were making their way down the hall, feeling along the walls, while being guided by the voice in the dark. Suddenly, without warning, a large sonic boom blasted in the distance, forcing half the group to their knees. Trevor woke up in a cold sweat. He heard loud, hard knocks alongside the boat. Whatever the sound was, it must have slipped into his dream, which ultimately woke him up. Trying to shake the awful memories his dream had conjured up, he rubbed his eyes with his fingertips while palming the rest of his face. Then, in one swift downward motion and some pressure along his nose, mouth and chin, he gave his entire face a refreshing stretch as he came to remember where he was. It was Paco's boat, and they were now at sea.